chapter 4 and verse number 7. Thank you, Christ. We have it on the screen, or we may notice it together in our Bible. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Actually, we could stop there and praise God for the rest of the day because his grace is greater than our sin. Oh my God. Oh yeah. I said, his grace is greater than our sin. See, y'all playing with me. Because it's some big time sinners in here. But his grace is greater than our sin. said it this way, where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. So we give God praise for his grace. Verse number eight, wherefore he said, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto me. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. I would like to dedicate this brief message to the memory of my beloved father, the Honorable Bishop James Edison Tyson. And today's message is entitled, Doctrine in Demonstration. Doctrine in demonstration. The social climate in America is continuing to shift with an aggressive negative slant toward Jesus Christ and toward the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is no longer a foregone conclusion that the majority of Americans consider the Bible to be the moral compass for their lives. It is no longer a foregone conclusion that most Americans consider the church to be the religious institution through which they receive spiritual enlightenment and direction. With all of these differing theories, philosophies, and hypotheses concerning God and spirituality, the one thing that will differentiate the apostolic church from all of these other false doctrines and false religions is one thing, the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. When people see the Holy Ghost in demonstration, when they see it in all of us, it will create a distinction between that which is true and that which is false. We've got a lot of work to do in the body of Christ, and we have a lot of work to do individually as members of the body that will produce the type of impact on the culture that is necessary at a time where skepticism has become the order of the day. According to the teachings of the Apostle Paul, 
there are several things that we must do in the church before we can significantly impact what is happening outside of the church. If you'll notice Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13, in this passage, Paul gives us a fourfold objective for the giving of the gifts of the Spirit. They're found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible said, till we all come in the unity of the faith, that's number one, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, that's number two, unto a perfect man, that's number three, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that's number four. I'd like to look at that verse just a little closer, for it is my consideration that which is making the body of Christ unable to maximize the influence of godliness on the culture is not a lack of power. It is the lack of the unity of the faith. Mm. I was in Los Angeles on yesterday and there was literally a church on every corner in South Central Los Angeles. However, the community around these churches was not impacted by the presence of these churches in those communities. There was a drug dealer on almost every other corner. There was a crack house on every other corner. There was a red light district almost on every other street. Yet all of these churches were in the midst of these communities. I am a strong advocate for ecumenical fellowship and partnership when it comes to anything that is going to bless people and going to help the community. But I want Christ Church to be clear in our understanding that ecumenical or interfaith fellowship does not constitute the unity of the faith. You see, you can sing with people but not believe the same thing. You can shout with them and dance with them but not have the same perception of the unity of the faith. What is meant by this term unity in the faith? Well, unity in the faith is coming to a common understanding and practice of the core truths of the faith as taught to us in the Bible by Jesus and by the apostles. You will discover in the scripture that these core truths are also referred to as the doctrine of Christ or the apostles' doctrine. Mm -hmm. So then, if someone were to ask you, what does it mean to be apostolic? What exactly is the Apostles' Doctrine. Well, let's look and find out from the Scripture. The Apostles' Doctrine is the body of teachings, practices, and standards of conduct given and established by the Apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ to the disciples in the early church. So then, the natural question in progression would be, where did the apostles get their doctrine from? The answer is twofold. Number one, they got their doctrine from the Lord Jesus himself. And secondly, they got their doctrine from the revelation 
of the Holy Spirit. So then, what is the apostles doctrine? I would like to submit to you that the apostles doctrine includes four primary sections. In section number one, the apostles doctrine would involve an unwavering affirmation of the inspired scriptures as the final authority for faith and practice in the church. We have a challenge now because so many individuals are coming to the table with man-made philosophies yes. and man-made ideas yes, they are. and trying to equate them as equal in authority to the scripture. But the Holy Scripture said, let God be true and every man a liar. I don't know how you all feel about it on this morning, but I still believe that the Bible is right. Yes, sir. Preach. The second consideration in section one of the Apostles' Doctrine is the preaching of the resurrected Jesus as our only Lord and our only Savior. That is important. Because now there are many teachings in the culture uh -huh. that there are many ways or many paths to God that is not what the scripture teaches. Preach. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's right. He said, I am the door. And if a man attempts to come to God any other way, he is a thief and a robber. Jesus said, I, not we, I am Preach. the Lord, the truth and the life. So then our position is there is only one Lord and there is only one Savior and his name is Jesus. Preach. The third consideration in section one of the Apostles' Doctrine is preaching repentance yes. and faith in God through Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Now you say, well, Pastor Tyson, I'm a good person. I attempt to treat people right. I love my family. I'm honest on my job. All of that is commendable. But the problem is, all of us were born in sin. We were shaped in iniquity. It's not our fault that we were born in sin. It is because of Adam's transgression that the sin gene was passed down to every human being. So then, in order for an individual to receive salvation, he must confess, I am a sinner, and I am in need of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot earn salvation. You cannot buy salvation. You cannot receive it because of your good works. It can only be obtained by faith in Jesus Christ. And then finally, number four, it is the promise of the Holy Spirit, including, watch this, saints, not just the power of the Spirit, but the gifts of the Spirit. That's something that we have been lacking in the apostolic church, our emphasis has been upon power. But power is no good if you don't use it. What good is it to have a Lamborghini in the garage and you ride around on a bicycle? That 
doesn't make any sense. The power of the Holy Ghost comes with giftings. We're going to talk about that in a second. Then section number two of the Apostles' Doctrine deals with number one, worship. It deals with church life and how the church should be organized. Friend, I want to say to you that God is a God of order. Wherever you see mass confusion, disorientation, disconnect, you know God is not in that. He said, let all things be done decently and in order. It is a sin to be a Sunday morning wonder, to be running around a church, speaking in tongue, dancing down the aisle, jumping over pews, talk about Jesus, 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 and then get to work on Monday and be the worst employee in the oh, whole country. God. God is a God of order. order. Secondly, the Apostles' Doctrine deals with standards of discipline and methods of correction. Mm. Everyone say to the saint nearest you, there is protection in correction. Thank God that the scripture is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my pathway. Thirdly, the Apostles' Doctrine deals with qualifications for leadership. The Apostles' Doctrine, number four, deals with marriage and family life. Number five, it deals with work ethic. The scripture said that if a man does not work, he should not eat. Oh God. Can I pause here for a moment and talk to all of the women in the church and tell you that it is okay for you to help your man. It's okay for you to be a support to him. It's great that you are a cover for him. But if you're going to marry a grown man, it is not your assignment to be his mama. It is not your calling to be working 40, 50, 60 hours a week while he is sitting on your couch watching Sports Center. Oh, the devil is a liar. He must have a work ethic if he's even going to be considered as a candidate for marriage. And somebody said, I could do bad all by myself. I don't need to add injury to insult and misery to madness dealing with some lazy, sorry piece of meat man that won't work in a pie factory or keep a job for two weeks. I want all the men in this church to say with a loud voice, work ethic. Work ethic! The scripture deals with work ethic. Then number six, the apostles' doctrine deals with separation from the world and consecration to God. So then, when a person receives Jesus Christ, not only do they receive new life, they also receive new lifestyle. Amen. All Amen. things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Wherefore saith God, come ye out from among them, Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. One of the reasons why the black Muslims do not respect many Christians is because they see Christians with a duplicitous lifestyle. They see Christians who claim that Jesus is pure, but they cuss every other word. Preach! 
They see Christians who claim that Christ is clean, but they're smoking marbles. They say, well, you say Christ changed your life, but there you are in the same sinful activities that you were involved in before you came to know Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit not only gives you new life, it gives you new lifestyle. Yeah. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Separation from the world. I want to encourage you to stop being ashamed of being identified as a saint of God. Stop being ashamed of being identified as a Christian. For we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. How many here this morning are very glad that you're saved? See, that's the question that I want to ask you today. And I have to ask you that because I've been watching some of you since the worship service has started today. And, and, and your face don't look very glad to be saved. Your countenance does not have a, a certain type of expectation to it that says God may turn every negative device in my life into a positive outcome with the next praise. Your body language does not indicate that you believe that God is sitting in the seat next to you on that pew waiting for you to do like the woman with the issue of blood and just reach out and touch him. The tonality of your voice, the silence thereof, the library style atmosphere that is in the sanctuary that should be filled with a spirit of celebration and a spirit of praise is an indication to me that you're not quite where David was when he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Maybe one of the reasons why I'm a little more glad than normal today is because I, I dealt with three young people under the age of 50 that died on this week. Maybe I'm a little more glad because this time last year I was in the hospital in full renal failure. Maybe I'm a little more glad because today when I got off the airplane, I did not have to ride in a wheelchair. Today I was able to walk through the Los Angeles airport and walk through the Atlanta airport and walk through the Indianapolis airport. And the only reason that you can sit in a service like this and wait for somebody to entertain you is because you have forgotten the last time that God dug you up out of a horrible pit. You have forgotten the last time that God forgave you of an abominable sin. You have forgotten the last time that God healed your body when the doctor said something is going on with you that I can't do anything about. You should never come into a worship service and treat worship like you have another chance. You should treat every praise like it's the first praise and the last praise. You need to get over yourself, get over your mood, 
but I promise you I'm going to get there in just a few minutes. Praise his name. So you got to learn how to stir yourself when there is no praise team, when, when there is no choir, or when there is no B.B. Wyman's, when, when there is no Fred Hammond, when, when there is no Kirk Franklin, when there is no Mississippi Mass Choir. You got to learn how to go in your bathroom and, and shut the door and look yourself in Look yourself in the face and say, I shall not die, but live. You got to tell yourself next week is going to be better than last week. You got to tell yourself God is going to make a way for me to pay all these back bills. I just heard the Holy Ghost. Grab somebody by the hand and tell them God was trying to tell you on last week when that billionaire paid off all those kids at Morehouse. Paid off all their student loans. Uh, it was at Morehouse. Uh, ask them, can you hear God telling you? Uh, you got more coming to your house. Find three people and tell them more is coming to your house. More favor, more income, more finances, more love, more peace, more joy, more happiness, more tanabasha, more than you ever experienced in your life. And somebody said, well, pastor, I'm 50 years old now. I'm 60 years old. You ought to be the first one running around the church because God's word for, me, for you is I saved the best for last. Get off. Uh, hallelujah. And tell them the Lord is saying, Your latter shall be greater than your former. Tell them you have not even imagined what God is about to do in this season of your life. It's about to. This is the third section, number one. It is faithful and sacrificial giving to help the needy and to advance the work of the kingdom. On days that I knew my dad was tired, if, if, I, knew, if I knew he just came off the road, I knew he was traveling, things of that nature. If I was playing the organ in that service, I would play like I was going crazy because I would want to give him some of my energy, some of my virtue. You all know how I preach, you know how I minister, and, and I need you to give something back to me today more than a spare. surrounding. You have to be aware of how your worship 
destroys yokes and how it lifts burdens and how it breaks strangleholds of thoughts of suicide. And that is the second dimension of the apostolic doctrine. It is spiritual warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. The third aspect of apostolic doctrine is caution against false teachers and erroneous doctrine. Right. Let's move on. Section number four of the apostles' doctrine is belief in the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the afterlife. You do not just dissipate into nothingness when you die. There is life after life. You are really in uh, the dress rehearsal for eternal life. There is hope beyond the grave. Then secondly, the apostles' doctrine deals with what is called eschatology. That is the study of the end time. It is the promise that Jesus is coming again. And he is going to take the church back to glory with him. We've got to stay rapture ready. Have a seat for a minute and just bring your energy this way. In Jude chapter 1 and verse number 3. There it is on the screen. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, when he says common salvation, he's saying that this group over here doesn't get saved one way. This group over here gets saved another way. This group over here gets saved another way. No, there's just one way. It is the common salvation. That's it the was Bible. needful for me the to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for, let everybody say, the faith, the faith. which was once delivered unto the saints. That is what Paul calls the unity of the faith that we must strive to live in so that we do not end up in heresy. If we wander away from the truth, then we will wander away from the unity of the faith. There are many different types of wandering in the scripture. There is number one, the wandering from the faith through greed. Death, through greed. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 8. And having food and raiment, let us there let us therewith be content. Uh, I want to say something to you because some of you think that I'm trite. You think I'm trivial. You think that I'm surface. You think I'm a, a, a bozo the clown. When you see me dancing around here and, and running and giving God praise and some of you think he's not serious, let me tell you something. Tell him, Bishop, tell when him. I start dancing, I'm not dancing because of what I hear. I'm dancing because of what I see. I'm not dancing because of the drums and a guitar and an organ. I, dancing because I saw a bullet fly past your son's head. That's why I'm dancing. Now, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of personal detail. I'm not going to call no names, but I'm going to tell you this. All of y'all that think that praise is trite, that praise is trivial, that praise, I, I don't do that. that. That's not who I am. Come I on, Bishop! Come on! Cultured. I am articulated. I have degrees. I went to this school. 
water, and this is not, this is beneath me. Let me tell you something, which is the least we have a young one of our sons in this church. The devil came to take his life on last week. He was literally shot. And I saw him dancing in the spirit on Friday night, giving God praise on the leg that he could not walk on when he came in the service. Let me tell you something. He came in the service unable to walk, but when the praise hit the house and he got up out that bench and thought, uh oh, I should be in a graveyard. And began to give God praise. God got in his leg. That's trying to come in the church. There's a cancer spirit that's trying to come go through the church. Yeah. But if I could get everybody in Christ Church yeah, to give God a cancer crushing praise yeah, for just about 30 seconds, God will heal every cancer that's in this room. If you keep praising him like that, he's going to heal colon cancer, stomach cancer, breast cancer, brain cancer, and I declare by his stripes, you are. And they shall recover. Take your Holy Ghost hand and lay them on four or five people and tell them, be healed, be healed, be healed, be healed. Hallelujah. Be healed. Hallelujah. And have that day. Thank you. Thank you. Happy seats for a minute. Hallelujah. Almost there. Almost there. Stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. You said my, my grandmother had it. My great grandfather had it. Hallelujah. But I'm going to tell you something. You may have it, but God said you'll live with it. But I will contain it in your body. God said I'll stop it from spreading. I'll stop it dead in each God. I'll stop it dead in its track. I'll stop it from metastasizing. I'll stop it from spreading to your body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen I'm almost there? First Timothy 6 and 8. See, I got to stir you. I got to make you remember. Because the devil will make you focus, son, on only the negative thing. Yep. He'll make you focus on what you don't have. So you lose sight of everything that you do have. And in verse number eight, he said, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. I'm not the only one here this morning that can remember when you had to eat noodles for dinner, peanut butter sandwiches. Now, I'm not the only one that didn't have money to buy groceries. Wonder where we were going to get diapers for Jamie from. Where we were, where we were going to get milk money from. And I've been to my door many days. Went to the door and packages of groceries were sitting at my door. Sometimes when I'm dancing, I'm dancing for the groceries that an angel dropped off at our efficiency apartment door. Oh, I haven't forgotten that. I haven't forgotten that old Randy Vega that I had with 
holes in the floorboard I, that wouldn't start when it was raining. I, I have forgot when I was living in my car and had to come in the church to shower and to change my one pair of clothes. I haven't forgotten that. See, some of us have forgotten where God brought us from. I'm going to praise him for every dinner he put on the table this week. I'm going to praise him for every piece of clothes that's hanging up in the closet. I'm going to praise him for every pair of shoes that is in the closet. I'm going to praise him that I got a car to drive. It might not be a Lexus. It might not be a Mercedes. But I'm not riding the bus. I'm not walking anymore. I've got enough to give God praise for for the rest of the day. And I'm not a Let us stay awake, can you tell me? I say, yeah, pastor's son, homeless, that is correct. Homeless, living in my car, coming in the church for 5 a.m. prayer, act like I was coming for prayer, sleeping back in the locker room behind the old sanctuary. But oh, God is a good God. God has provided. Look at verse number nine, but they that will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So then there was a wandering from the faith because we, we want riches more than we want righteousness. The second wandering from the faith is accepting false teaching. Look what the Bible said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness and their word will eat at the a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, uh, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. It is 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20 that I am concerned with because I'm preaching uh, in remembrance of Bishop James Edison Tyson. Oh, Sean, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babbling and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace with be with thee, amen. So then, the true on, unity of the faith can only be put into practice by rightly dividing what the Bible is teaching in context and living that on a daily basis. Yet for most Christians today, we don't want to hear the word doctrine. Right. We want to talk about experience, right. but we don't want to talk about doctrine. Right. Yeah. But let me read for you 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, and I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they, that the church shall teach no other doctrine. Teach no other doctrine. Say it again, teach no other doctrine. Teach no other doctrine. Um, that's Preach. my assignment. Preach. Preach. Teach no other doctrine. No other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogy which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. Now the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and 
and faith unfeigned, from which some have swerved, having turned aside to vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, but not understanding what they say, nor can they confirm what they say. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. If there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. My dad said it this way, if your doctrine is not correct, your experience will not be correct either. That is the truth. What Paul was telling Timothy and the church at Ephesus is what I'm telling you, that Doctrine is the most important thing. It's more important than singing. It's more important than dancing. Now, listen to Romans chapter 16 and verse number 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. What you believe is the most important thing about you because if you are believing the wrong thing, then your faith is in vain. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now the church, the first 43 years, has been operating in the power of the Spirit. And that is good and that is great. But now, in this season, in a season of spiritual maturity, God is now calling for every saint to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. There are three reasons why Christ gives spiritual gifts. It is found in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 12. God gives spiritual gifts, number one, for the perfecting of the saints. Second Corinthians chapter 7 and 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. Clean the dust off the altar, yes. perfecting holiness yes. in the fear of God. Number two, God gives spiritual gifts for the work of the ministry. There are many of you that have to stop coming in here on Sunday morning only. Right. And find yourself working your gift yes. in the ministry. Yes. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Somebody said to me, Pastor, where are all the young people? And I said to them, they are where you are, missing in action. You see, God gives every individual a sphere of influence. If you are not using the gift that God has given you, you are going to have the blood to minister to. He's 
objects say the ark of this, uh, you must fulfill. Your charge from God is to take that gift and maximize it for the glory of God. This is the third reason for the giving of the gifts. For the end of time of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse number 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the end of of the church. I'd like for you to just reach over and touch somebody and tell them I am determined to let God use me to bless your life. Now, if I see you falling, now, I'm going to step in there and pick you up. Now, if I see you hurting, now, I'm going to step in there and ask God to you me to heal you. Now, if I see you are lacking, now, I'm going to ask God to take what I have. Now, and I'm going to do like Jesus did. Now, the riches and the loaves. Now, I'm going to break it and break it and break it and bless it. Now, God use me to bless your life. I want you to shake somebody's hand now. Like you're going to shake it all now. And tell them, say, hey, hey, hey. You don't have to go to a mini hit crusade to get healed. When you grab my hand, healing came out of my hand and went into your body. Some of you don't understand what you have. You don't recognize the power that you have. You jump into everybody else's prayer line. When you got the power to heal yourself, you're waiting on somebody else to prophesy to you. With the word of power, it's in your own mouth. So the Bible said, tell them that it's time to release the gifts. Somebody said, well, Pastor Tyson, now, I know I've got the Holy Ghost, now, and I know that I spoke in tongues, now, but I don't know what else I have. Well, I'm going to tell you what you have. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 8, the Bible said, for to one is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, to another faith by the Spirit, to another the gift of healing, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. I wonder how many messages we have missed from God running around this church talking about how Tawashi Kenebo sat down, but nobody is interpreting the tongues. But somebody in Christ Church has the gift of interpretation, and you've got to lose that gift so that we might have understanding. Lift your hand and say yes. Somebody said, well, pastor, what is the word of knowledge? Well, the word of knowledge is supernatural insight given by the Holy Spirit, giving you an awareness of something that you could not have known by human intellect alone. The word of wisdom and the word of knowledge, they work together. The word of knowledge is what 
to do. But the word of wisdom is how to do it. And I prophesy on this morning that you are not going to struggle. Living paycheck to paycheck for the rest of your life. God's going to give you a concept. God's going to give you an idea. God's going to give you a vision plan. Now, not only is he going to tell you what to do, but he's going to tell you how to do it. You see, the word of wisdom gives you insight into the future. You can look down the road at 2020 and see what God is setting up to happen in the future. I'm sorry, saints. God told me stop right there and command you to grab somebody by the hand and look them in the eye and tell them God told the pastor to tell you for all the hell that you have been through this year, you shall have glory for it on next year. And if you believe that Jesus Christ is not trapped in the past, if you believe that the battle is already won, if you believe that the curse is already reversed, take your praise and shift it out of 2019 and project it to where you're going to be. On this time next year, take about 30 seconds and praise him in a future tense posture. Shake somebody's hand like we're going to shake it off and tell you better shake yourself. Or you get stuck in that depression. I said, tell you better shake yourself before you get stuck in that bad relationship. I said, tell you better shake yourself before you get stuck with that incurable disease. Because some of you are holding back on the praise God wants. Because in your emotion, you say, I don't feel like it today. Well, whether you feel like it or not, I come to tell you that God feels like blessing you. I come to tell you that God feels like helping you. I come to tell you that God feels like lifting you. So if you can stir yourself back into a future tense posture and give God a praise.
it hurt to sustain you. What I'm trying to tell you is that your next blessing is about to come from unexpected places and unexpected people. But in order for it to be released, you've got to give God an unexpected praise. You see, the devil was dependent on you sitting down today. He was counting on you to keep your mouth shut today. He was counting on you not to dance today. But if I can get somebody to take about 60 seconds and release an unexpected radical worship, if I can get 50 worshipers to praise him, Step out of your seat and run. Tell five people, praise him the way you don't feel.
to tell anybody else to do what you want to do yourself. Preach! Come on, come on! Don't tell me you brought a good praise on a bad day. And you can't summon your own spirit to give God that praise. Today, the Spirit of the Lord <laughs> is calling for the manifestation of every dormant gift, the stirring of it, yes. the releasing of it, Hallelujah. the manifestation of it. It's in you, and it must come forth. Bow your ears in the presence of the Lord. Save us from this untoward generation and use our lives to bring you glory. If there's anyone here today that wants to become a son of God, a disciple of Christ, be a bearer of God's goodness and of God's glory, get up out of your seat right now and make your way to this altar. Tell the Lord, save me now. Is there a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, someone here today that will say, I want to be used by God to fulfill his purpose and his plan for my life? Come now.
please lift your hand high. That way our ushers could see you if you have not received one as of yet. Everyone else, I ask you as if you can, come as close to it as possible to get a $13 offering, even if you're not participating in the, in the weekly challenge. Come as close to it as you can to go toward our debt liquidation. That way we can continue to be a debt-free church. Let our officers come very, very quickly as we're preparing to give today. Get the best offer that you can. If you give it by way of debit or credit card, Sister Higgins is available to my left and to your right. She's available there to serve you. You may also give electronically, whether it is by cash app or by PayPal, that is available to you as well. For those of us that normally give by way of the Christchurch app, of course we know that our system is currently down at the moment, but as we are in the process of restructuring our system, I'm asking you to find your means of being able to give this morning. As soon as you get this afternoon, as soon as you get your offering in your hand, Stand with me all over the room. Even if you don't have anything to give, stand with me that way we can bring the blessing of the Lord upon you and have moving expeditiously uh, toward our dinner today. How many were blessed by the word of God today? Come on, even as you're standing, how many were blessed by the word of the Lord? Lift your offering or lift your hand unto the Lord. Now, Father, in the name of the Lord, Jesus, bless this offering that we are about to give unto you now. I pray that you would have respect toward the giver, and I pray that you would sanctify this offering. God, be pleased with what we give to you, God, as we are uh, as we are proving ourselves to be good stewards over what you have provided to us. Now, Father, we will give you great glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Come from wherever you are in the sanctuary, and let's give in this moment. Come from wherever you are. Come from wherever you are. to come back again at 5 p.m. tonight. Uh, Pastor YPJ Miller is already on the road from South Bend here uh, to be able to minister to us on tonight. He's a powerful, powerful man of God, um, international evangelist and pastor that is blessing the country and the world. And you want to be sure that you are with us during that worship service. We appreciate you so much for worshiping God with us today. Christ Church, if they're still here, help me honor God for our visitors and our guests that are worshiping God with us today. Oh, come on, let's honor God for them. So glad that you have worshiped God with us on this day. We pray that you are blessed by the presence of the Lord and by the word of God as well. Everybody standing. Everyone standing. Join hands with your brothers and sisters. Look forward to seeing everybody at dinner in just a few moments. Tell your brother and sister next to you, I love you with the love of the Lord. If you only told one, tell another. Tell them I love you with the love of the Lord. Caitlin, I want you to come and pronounce the blessing of the Lord on the people of God as we are heading toward Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the word that was uh, preached to us today. I pray, oh God, that it be for the edifying of our souls, the changing of our souls, Lord. God, we ask that you continue to do your great work in this place. And we want to continue to see miracles, signs, and wonders like never before. And again, God, we give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you the honor for what you've done on tonight. 
that we are expecting greater on tonight. And it is so in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Everybody, let's move expeditiously out of the sanctuary, if you would please. Greet your brothers and sisters as you're